It's great to be here. Another Wednesday night. Maybe, maybe by the end of this year, we'll learn how to set up the chairs without gaping holes in the middle of the room. Um, hey, just one quick FYI. Um, this is one of three of the last normal nights of youth group. Uh, crazy. If you're a senior in the room, you're like this close to graduating. That's wild. Um, so we got this week and then two more weeks that are going to be kind of normal, just like tonight. And then, uh, then we have sort of a flurry of activity. There'll be May 1st, we don't have high school youth group. We're doing a special fifth grade preview night that's just for middle schoolers where those teeny tiny fifth graders that are going to be sixth graders next year get sort of a peek at what, at what youth group is like. And it's just too intimidating for them to do that with all the big, strong high school kids in here. So that night's middle school only, and, and you guys will have the night off. And then the week after that is our senior banquet, which you are all invited to. There's maybe some... Uh, confusion there at some times during the year, like, is this just for seniors? But the whole high school is invited. There's no middle school that night. And uh, we do invite the families of our graduates. So if you're here tonight or have been in our youth ministry for a while and you come on that senior banquet night, you're invited to bring your family we're asking that like, if your parents or brother and sister come or whatever, that they register online so we know how many extra people we have because there's going to be food and stuff that night, and we want to make sure there's enough. And if you're a graduate, uh, if you know for a fact that you have not sent me a baby photo or a senior photo or ask your parents if they sent that, then I need those because I'm making a little video of our graduates. So uh, many of you have not sent me those. That's just for seniors. If you're graduating, send me baby photo and senior photo, and uh, that would be awesome. Okay, um, I brought some things on stage with some, some show and tell uh, right here, a couple different things. I've got this Reflect water bottle, okay? Uh, I like the color, it's a good shade of blue. However, it is uh, hand wash only, and uh, so I can't stick it in the dishwasher, and so really it just sort of sits in my office. I grabbed it there, and uh, I, don't, I think I've used it once or twice in its entire life. I got it for free at a conference, though. So, I mean, it says reflect, and the, the letters kind of reflect, which is kind of interesting. But uh, anyway, it's that. It's nothing super special. I've got this uh, book, Reforming Journalism. Um, a decently hefty boy here, and, uh, you know, you're talking 365 pages uh, on reforming journalism. I have not read this, um, so I can't really tell you whether or not it's good, but I can tell you that I probably never will read it because uh, it doesn't seem like a great use of my time right now. But I uh, got it for free, so it's not like it's a bad deal necessarily. I just got it uh, handed to me at one point. This is a yarmulke. You guys know what a yarmulke is? Traditional... Traditional Jewish head covering. Um, yeah, Ben Shapiro right here. Uh, yeah, it's got the Star of David on it. Looks kind of cool. Looks like it might be special to me, but it's really not. Uh, somebody just, it's actually Jake Walton. You guys know Jake. Uh, he, I was in his office one time, and he's like, hey, you've been to Israel, right? I was like, uh, yeah. He goes, here you go. <laughs> okay, what am I supposed to do with a yarmulke? I shouldn't have even taken it from him because it is now just sat in my office uh, collecting dust and I, like, it doesn't really remind me of my time in Israel necessarily. I just got it for free from Jake Walton. So it's like, okay, thanks, I guess. Uh, it was sitting on his shelf probably and now it's just sitting on my shelf. 
Well, I show you these three things because they all have something in common, and that's that they were all given to me for free. Free gifts. Everybody loves free stuff, right? Free things are great things, usually. Although, as you can maybe tell by me listing these things off, there, there are maybe some drawbacks that happen with free things. Uh, I personally have a bit of a love-hate relationship with free stuff. Why? Because if somebody's giving me something for free, it's probably not all that valuable, right? Uh, and a lot of the free things I get just end up as junk sitting on my shelf until I'm finally like, okay, I can throw this away, right? Uh, and besides that, some of these free things... Um, there's also like a, a suspicion in my heart with a lot of free things like, is this actually free? Or are you trying to hand me something so that you can get my contact information and send me spam or something? You know, it's like everything at the fair, like sign up, just leave your email address, and then you get a free fan that you will immediately throw in the trash after this, okay? There's so many free things that are handed to you, but you still had to pay admission to the fair to get them, and then you had to give over your personal information, and you walk leaving with a bag full of junk asking yourself, did I just get scammed? <laughs> like, did, is this free stuff really not free at all? Like, has anyone like me ever been duped into paying like $20 more than you were planning on spending just so you could unlock free shipping? Okay, that's happened to me a couple times. Or like a free mystery gift that they throw in once you hit the $50 mark, and it turns out to be a piece of junk that you don't care about. Free things sound great at first, but sometimes after a while, you get a lot of free stuff, and you realize that your house just looks like a hoarder lives there, and you're like, I gotta clean this junk out. It's just so much junk. And maybe, maybe it wasn't even free. We're in the middle of a series called Essentials, and uh, throughout this series, we've been talking about some of those elements of the gospel that are totally essential to the good news. If you lose this piece, then you've lost the gospel altogether. And tonight, we're talking about how it is that somebody comes to place their faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to imagine that you are on an island and that island is way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean or something, and uh, there's a giant volcano on it that's about to erupt. The whole island is totally doomed to destruction. Your only hope is to escape off the island somehow. Unfortunately, at first, there's nothing. There's no hope of escape. You're trapped there in the middle of the ocean, doomed to destruction. That's a picture of us in our sinful state. And Chuck DeClean was here a couple weeks ago, and he talked about sin, right? And he talked about how our sin separates us from God and how, as a whole, humanity, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are doomed to destruction. A couple weeks back, Zach Brooks was here, and he talked about Jesus Christ, how he lived a perfect life and died a sacrificial death on our behalf. And that, when you combine it with the resurrection that we just celebrated on Easter, equals the grounds for salvation for each one of us. Without Jesus, we have no hope for salvation. So if you're on the island doomed to destruction, Jesus is the pilot and the plane that comes in and says, I'm going to take you from this island. I am offering you a way of salvation from the impending destruction that's there. Tonight, we talk about how somebody goes from being a resident of that island to being someone who actually bravely takes the step onto the plane. How do you transfer from the dominion of destruction onto the saving force that is Jesus Christ? Well, if you've been around the church for a while, you know this is an easy and an awesome answer, right? For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Salvation is free. There's no admission charge. Jesus doesn't stand at the doorway to the airplane saying, hand over $500 and then you can come on board. He doesn't say, how 
uh, morally righteous are you? How uh, good is your character? And he doesn't have a quiz asking you about the bad things you've done. He just says, if you would like to be saved, you can come on board this plane and I will take you safely away from this place that is doomed to destruction. An amazing truth that salvation is something that is offered to us completely for free. And yet, my guess is that maybe for some of you, this beautiful truth of the gospel has a hard time finding rest in your heart at times. Because if you're like me, sometimes you get suspicious about free stuff. You think, if Jesus is giving away salvation for free, maybe it's not all that good. Maybe it's just junk that's going to sort of collect dust on my shelf. How good is salvation, really, if Jesus is just handing it out to anybody? Or maybe you would think, salvation, that sounds great. I want that, but he wouldn't really give it to us for free. There's a hidden fee here. There's an asterisk. There's fine print at the bottom here. I'm wondering, is there a cost to this, really? Is salvation really free, or is this some sort of bait and switch? That's what I want to talk to you about tonight. I want you to know that the gift of salvation that God offers is far beyond what you would ever dare to believe, and that it's given solely because of his kindness and love for you. That's the big idea here. You can write that down. You can think about it. This is what I want to convince you of tonight. When you leave, I want you to know for sure that the gift of salvation that God offers is far beyond anything you would ever dare to believe in your wildest dreams. It's so good. It's so amazing that it's not even close to something that would just collect dust on your shelf. This is the best news you have ever heard in your entire life. It's indescribable. It's unfathomable. It's beyond beyond anything you would ever dare believe. And there's no hidden fees. There's no asterisk. There's no uh, bait and switch. This is something that's given solely because of God's kindness and his love for you. So in order to prove this, I want to take a little bit of time tonight simply looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We're going to go fairly quickly through these verses, but it basically shows us how salvation happens. How does salvation occur and in what is involved in it? And as we go through this, we're going to see that the gift of salvation that God offers is far beyond anything you would ever dare believe and that it's given solely because of his kindness and love for you. Before we do that, I want to take a moment and pray. Guys, we're talking about something tonight that truly is unfathomable, and by that I mean we, our minds can't comprehend it, really. I'm going to fail to describe the beauty of the gospel to you tonight, but maybe if the Holy Spirit is here and working in your heart, and maybe if God illuminates his word to you, there might be some of you that would leave here today with just a tiny glimmer of the reality of what is yours in the gospel. And maybe your entire life would be changed by that. So let's pray and ask for God's help uh, as we look at his word. Father, as we open up your word and look at it, I pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would be at, the work, at work in the hearts of these students and leaders. Help us to walk away from here convinced of the beauty and the awesomeness of the good news of the gospel, that the salvation that you have offered us is far beyond anything we would ever dare believe. And God, help us to rightly understand what it is we bring to the table, that we didn't earn it ourselves, that we didn't pay an admittance fee, but that it was given 100% because of your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so like I said, we're going to be looking at Ephesians, 1 through, or Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can turn there. 
Uh, Ephesians is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Ephesus, and he's telling them a lot of things about what the gospel is and how the gospel impacts their lives. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, you have like one of the most amazing passages of scripture in the entire Bible that really beautifully describes um, who we were outside of Christ and who we are now in Christ. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to see how salvation occurs to convince you of that main point, that salvation is both valuable and free, okay? We start with the fact that we are doomed, okay? I'm going to move quickly through this because this is essentially what Chuck talked to us about several weeks back when he talked about sin from Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. But uh, let's read what Paul says about it here in Ephesians and take away some important notes here. The first three verses say this, as for you, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So this is a description of, of what's called the natural man. That means man in his natural state, who you are or were without Jesus Christ. Before God does any sort of intervention, before he does anything to change anything up, this is our natural state. It begins by saying you were dead. Dead in your transgressions and sins. And this is really telling Because remember, we're talking about how salvation happens, how you go from being on that island doomed to destruction to how you get on the plane taking you to eternal life. If someone is dead, do they have any ability whatsoever to do something on their own accord? Easy question, no, okay? You are incapable of offering anything to the table. You don't bring anything to the table. You are dead, You can't clean yourself up. You can't make yourself nice and pretty. You can't do anything that would make you deserving of God's love or his affection. Obviously, we're talking here uh, about spiritual deadness. Uh, All of you are physically alive here, I hope. Um, Your heart is beating. You are breathing. But if you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible tells us that you are spiritually dead. And that spiritual deadness is actually what leads to our physical death. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, The wages of sin is death, right? Um, That spiritual deadness that all of us have apart from Jesus Christ means that we cannot please God. We cannot love him like we should. We cannot obey him. We are completely doomed, And not only are we spiritually dead, but even in our physical life that we live, we are slaves. We're trapped. It says that we're following three different things. It says, followed the ways of the world, that's one thing, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, that's speaking of the devil, okay? So we've got the world that we're following, the devil that we're following, and then lower down here it says, we're gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. So you're following the world, the devil, and your flesh, In a sense, you're like a dog on a leash that the devil is sort of pulling along and you're just consumed by what he wants you fixated on, by what the world, and in the world being sort of that wicked world system, whatever's popular, whatever's trendy, whatever uh, everybody else is doing, that's just sort of what you're following. No matter if you think you're like different or cool or not, you're not. If you're outside of Christ, you're just a slave to whatever it is that the world and the devil and your flesh tell you to do. You're following your heart. The problem is that your heart is desperately wicked outside of God. You are dead, and so you're just following whatever it is you crave. So we're spiritually dead. We are following the world, the devil, and our flesh. We are sinful by nature. In this last verse, it says, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So it's speaking of, this is how you are in your very DNA. 
This is what you're made up of. It's something that is by nature deserving of wrath. That word deserving is important because none of us have done anything to deserve eternal life. What we do deserve is God's wrath. And that means that if we understand this rightly, we understand that had God decided to just wipe out the earth, that would have been just fine in terms of what we deserved. Uh, It wasn't like, well, they're just innocent people that got deceived and lost, and, and we really deserve something better. But no, we're deserving of God's wrath, the Bible says. No ability to achieve salvation on our own. God could have obliterated the entire human race, and he would have been right to do so, but he chose something different. And we see that in the next crucial part of how salvation occurs. We start with the fact that we're doomed, but God loved you. God loves us. And we see that in the next couple verses. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So, God has saved us by grace, but why did he do it? What's his motivation? What what? Uh, persuaded God to come and save us? Why did Jesus come and die on the cross and provide a way of salvation for us? We see it right here. Not because we met him halfway, not because we elevated ourselves to a place where God saw some sort of merit within us, not because we were good enough or because we started seeking after God, trying to find him. It was because he sought after us because he loves us. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. We were by nature children of wrath, but God made us alive. Why did God love you? Why does God love me? To be honest, I don't really know that I can give a good answer for that. Other than it's God's nature, his character to love us. It doesn't mean he has to. It just means that God, rather than smoking us off the planet, prefers to take something ugly and disgusting and deserving of wrath and dead. And God loves resurrecting that, transforming it, making it new, and bringing it to new life. I was just reading in my Bible the other day in Micah chapter 7, and there's a verse, verse 18, where it says God delights in showing steadfast love. It's like his favorite thing to do is just to show love to people that don't deserve it. And it says right there at the end, it is by grace you have been saved. What's grace? It's like seven of your names, okay? Everybody's named grace these days. We got like at least five graces in this youth group, I think. But uh, what is grace? Why do people name their daughters grace? Well, most of us know that grace is something good. Uh, if, we've, if we've been around church, we're like, okay, grace, we like that. Grace, thumbs up for grace, that's a positive thing. Uh, but if you're asked to define it, it might be a little trickier. So let me give you a quick definition of grace. It's really simply this, undeserved favor. What is God's grace? It's something good, favor, he bestows upon you that you didn't earn. You didn't merit it. You didn't do anything to deserve it. God gives grace, not because it's earned, but by definition, because it's undeserved. Undeserved favor. Um, and there's a, there's a, this is maybe a small bunny trail, but I want to point out to you something here that is drawn right out of this idea of grace that I think might be an encouragement to you today. Part of my story 
is that I grew up in a home with two parents that both loved Jesus Christ. And from a young age, they taught me the gospel, they took me to church, uh, they read the Bible to me. And when I was only four years old, I placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I was almost five. I was like exactly the same age Alice is right now when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Some of you here have a very similar story to me where you got saved at a young age. Maybe mom or dad or a Sunday school teacher led you to Christ. And as a result of that, there's maybe a part of you that thinks, well, my story really, really isn't all that special. I mean... I got saved when I was a kid. I didn't do anything super rebellious. I you know, grew up going to church. My story isn't all that interesting. And so it's really like I'm dreading getting baptized or something like that because I don't want to share my boring story with everybody. Okay, based on what we have just learned tonight, is that true? Based on what we've just learned tonight, were you any closer to God as a innocent four-year-old than the most wicked person on earth is right now? No, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, right? That's what was true of you before you knew Jesus. You weren't close to God. You weren't seeking God. He was seeking you because he loved you, and he set his love on you and loved you enough that at an early age, he snatched you away from certain destruction and saved your life. So my story of getting saved as a four-year-old isn't anything less miraculous than some drug dealer murder person that gets saved, okay? Some people, and if you're here and you think, man, my story is nothing like yours, Andrew. I'm running from God. I'm far from God, and there's no way he could ever love me. No, what we've just said is that when I was four years old, I wasn't running after God, I wasn't pursuing him. I didn't love God any more than any other person does. God just loved me and he saved me. And that should tell you something. It tells you there's nobody that's born on third base, spiritually speaking. It wasn't like I was just born closer to being saved than everybody else and, and it just took an easy you know, RBI single to get me into home plate. No, I was dead. And so is anyone who doesn't have Jesus Christ. And when I place my faith in Jesus Christ, that was a miracle. And God does miracles every day. So this tells you something else. Not only is your story not boring, if, even if you were saved at a young age like me, but also, if you're here and you're running from God, or you feel like I'm so distant from God, or there's, there's so little hope for someone like me, you need to know that it was a miracle that God saved me, but he can do that same miracle in your life as well. That there is no one who is too far from God. No one too far. And if you're here tonight and maybe you love Jesus, but you're really burdened because you've got a friend or a, or a mom or a dad or somebody that you're just praying for, and they don't know Jesus, and they're running away, and you're thinking, there's no way that they're ever going to get saved. You need to know that there's no one too far away for God. He can snatch anyone out of the fire. He can work that miracle whenever he wants to. So don't stop praying. Don't stop asking God to do a work because it takes a miracle to save anyone. Whether they look like they're close to him or not, it takes a miracle. So, grace who was given to us, unearned favor, because God loves us. And I want to just, for our last point here, dive a little bit deeper into this idea of grace. Because I hope that as we've gotten this far, that I've convinced you maybe of at least half of that statement that I started with. That the gift of salvation that God offers is something that is given free of charge. Because... If it wasn't free, hopefully you've, you're understanding you're broke, spiritually speaking. You're dead. There's nothing you could do to earn your way. So unless God did all the work, then you are screwed. But if God did do all the work, then it truly is free. Now the question remains, is this free gift something that's really 
really great? Or is it just something that sits on your shelf and collects dust? God's grace was extravagant. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, you need to know that God's work in your life is so much more beyond what you can comprehend. And we're just going to see a sliver of it here in these next few verses. Paul says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. How good is the grace that God showed to you and to me if you're in him? He raised us up with Christ. You were once dead and helpless, unable to please God, unable to serve him, unable to do anything good in and of yourself, and God raised you to resurrection life. And now you're living a new life in Christ. And one day, that spiritual resurrection is sort of the the foretaste of a physical resurrection where we will be in heaven with God one day, raised to life with new bodies because he has raised us up with Christ. And then it says that he has seated us with him in the heavenly realms. This is crazy, okay? Imagine this. You're going to a football game. It's like the the biggest game of the year, like homecoming or your biggest rival or something. Everybody's going to be there. You're pumped. You love sitting in the student section. Everybody's chanting and cheering. It's going to be an amazing game. Bad news, though, you're running late. And that's really bad because those seats, in the, especially in the good part, the student section, where all the energy and the fun is, they fill up fast. And you call up your best friend who you know is already there, and you say, bro, tell me, please, that there are some seats available near you in the student section. He's like, bad news, bud. Everything's taken. Everybody's here. Why did you come late? Uh, there's maybe like one seat up in the nosebleeds next to some weird middle schoolers. I don't know. And you're just like... My life is ruined. I'm going to get to this game and it's not going to be any fun. I'm not going to be in the action. I'm not going to find a spot. I'm not going to be able to... It's not going to be good. But then your friend says, I'm just kidding. Everything is full, but I saved you a seat right next to me, right in the middle of the action. Like, God bless you. Okay? And now, now... Not only do you feel this great relief because your spot is saved, you're as good as there already. Your friend isn't going to give that seat up for anybody except you. You're so relieved you might even swing by Quick Trip and grab some extra snacks for the game, right? And then you show up when you get there. It doesn't matter because your seat is saved at the game. God has seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. That means that in a spiritual kind of sense, you are already there with Jesus in heaven. Your seat is saved there, and God isn't giving it up for anybody. You have a spot in heaven with Jesus, saved for you. That tells you something about eternal security as well. Here's another small bunny trail, but people ask, can I lose my salvation? Can I screw up so bad that, that I'm no longer saved anymore? Can we just turn like the logic part of our brains on for just a second and think about everything that we've just talked about? First of all, did you earn salvation to begin with? No. You were dead. Totally dead. So this isn't like a job promotion situation where you worked really, 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 really hard and impressed God and he said, all right, come on in, you're saved. And then you're like, oh, I'm underperforming now. And he says, sorry, you're fired. That doesn't happen. Why? Because you didn't do anything good to begin with. God brought you in because he loved you. So is God gonna take somebody that he loves and say, not in anymore, you screwed up too bad? No, 
you can't ever be worse off than you were when God invited you in. You're never more dead than the dead you were when God found you and saved you. And what's more, when God saved you, he saved you a seat in heaven. You're already there, as good as there. Your seat's not being given up for anybody. And so God has already committed to you, you're going to be here. The seed is saved. I'm not giving it up for anybody. The Bible says when you're saved, God writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. You know, there's no erasers in heaven. That's just, that's kind of a joke. But, but God doesn't erase people's names from that book. It's permanent. You're seated with him already. Okay? You can't lose your salvation primarily because you never earned it to begin with. God gave it to you because he loves you and he's going to keep you there because he loves you. Last thing I kind of want to point out here. Why did God seat us with Christ in heaven? Why did God do that? So that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Okay, read that one more time. Why does God want me seated with Christ in heaven? So that, in order that, in the coming ages, that's all of eternity, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Imagine Elon Musk comes up to you and says, Hey, I have sworn a blood oath that for the rest of your life, I am going to use all of the resources at my disposal to show you undeserved favor and kindness. I don't know about you, that would put a spring in my step. Because Elon Musk is worth $151 billion. That's a lot of resources with which he can show me undeserved favor and kindness, right? Now let me ask you, how does $151 billion compare to the incomparable riches of God's grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus? Maybe kind of like how a drop of water compares to the Pacific Ocean. Or how a grain of sand compares to the Sahara Desert. God has all the resources at his disposal. He has love for us like you've never experienced from anyone before. He has kindness to show to you that you just can't even imagine. It's... It's incomparable. Paul puts it another way in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's an argument from the greater to the lesser. He says, God already gave you his son, Jesus Christ. If he gave you that, then there's nothing else that's off the table. God has incomparable, immeasurable, undescribable, infinite grace for you and for me if we are in Christ. Eternal life is not a cheap trinket that stays on the shelf collecting dust. It's the most unimaginably beautiful, unfathomably generous gift that has ever been given and it's offered to you today. Did you earn it? Absolutely not. You could never earn something like that. Could you ever earn it? No. God gave it to you because he loves you. The gift of salvation that God offers is far beyond what you would ever dare to believe. And it's given solely because of his kindness and love for you. What's our response to all of this? Verse 10 gives us a clue 
It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And maybe you would be tempted here to say, there it is. There's the bait and switch. I've got to do good works. But I would remind you that this is all coming after salvation. God saves you first. He gives you grace. He pours out favor upon you. He saves your seat in heaven. And then the good works come. Secondly, look at how it says we are created in Christ Jesus. Remember Genesis chapter 1 when God creates the world and he says, let there be light. And where there used to be nothing, there was light. It's the same when God creates something in you. You were dead. There was nothing. And then God said, let there be light. Let there be a new creation. And he creates you new in Christ Jesus, making something out of nothing. And this new creation that he has worked is created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of doing good works, good works that God himself has laid out in advance for you to accomplish. That means these good works, they're not any sort of way that I'm paying God back. They're not me saying, well, God saved me, so I guess I need to pay him back for what he did and try to do these good works. No, this is just my new nature that God created from nothing inside me that now longs to love God, that longs to serve God, that wants to use my life to enjoy his grace and extend his glory and and leverage every single thing that he's possibly given me to walk in those good works that God prepared for me to do. Maybe you don't remember this, but a a couple months ago, I shared a story about how I was driving my grandpa's car, and I backed into the side of a cliff and just like punched a dent right in the back. And my grandpa graciously paid for the repairs, didn't say a thing about it later, and, and just took care of it. He never asked me to pay him back. It was all grace. Now, was my natural response in that moment to say, sweet, Now, every time I drive grandpa's car, boom, 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 like just ramming this thing, I can do whatever I want, grandpa's going to pay for it. No, that's silly, that's not anything that any sane person would do. The natural response is not that I'm trying to pay him back for the bumper, it's that I love my grandpa and I'm thankful for what he did to me, for me, so... I'm going to leave it with a full tank of gas next time I drive it, and I'm going to run it through the car wash next time I drive it, and, and I'm just grateful because he did that for me. That's like what this is. This isn't paying God back for anything, and this isn't an excuse for you to just go do whatever you want with your life. This is saying it's only natural that now you're a new creation, and God has started something brand new, and he's saved you from certain destruction. Now... I live my life in thankfulness to God, responding by following through with good works that God has prepared in advance for me to do. So, how valuable is eternal life, really? Is it like a free gift that you get handed and isn't really worth anything, or sits on your shelf collecting dust, or maybe it wasn't really free, there's a bunch of strings attached? No, eternal life is something that is more beautiful than anything you could ever comprehend. Far more than you ever dared hope, believe, and it's given solely because of his kindness to you. We're going to do something slightly different tonight. I want to invite our worship team to come back to the stage right now. And um, I thought after a message like this, it would be appropriate to respond in some kind of way. We've just been talking about the gospel and how good God has been to us. And I didn't want to just leave straight to small groups and maybe get distracted by other things. I thought maybe it would be good if we just took a moment to respond to what God has revealed. Maybe you're here and you are a believer in Jesus. My hope is that you're leaving tonight with a fresh understanding of the gospel and just a reminder of how good God has been to you. 
And if that's the case, then I would invite you to sing out and praise God in a way that you're just saying, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done in my life. And if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, during this time, I would just ask you to reflect and think, what's keeping me from Jesus right now? You are doomed apart from God, but Jesus loves you. He loves you more deeply than you could ever understand. And he has grace that's so far beyond anything you could ever comprehend. What would keep you from saying, Jesus, I want that. Would you save me? And if that's you tonight, I would just ask that during this time, during this song, that you would talk to God, do business with God, and and if you need to be saved tonight, then confess your sin to him. Admit that you're dead. And ask that Jesus would come and fill your life in a way that he never has before. That you would believe that it was his perfect life, his sacrificial death and his resurrection that made it possible for you to be saved. And you trust in that. And God will pour out grace in your life like you've never experienced. Let's stand together and sing one final song before we go to our groups.